I'm actually building this wonderful organic network of professionals in dental trying to fill this one position. Do you have enough to keep them busy? And you got to really look at that honestly, because the top talent won't stay with you if they're not staying busy. They want to feel appreciative and they want to have an impact. Most people right now, millennials, Gen Z, they don't want to come to work just to sit in a chair and get paid. Decades ago, you could say, well, at least I'm getting paid for it. And everyone would chuckle and agree with you. And now they're like, well, I'm not doing anything. I'm bored. Welcome back to another episode of Dental Marketing Theory. I'm your host, Gary Bird. I'm the founder of SMC National, where we help you create, convert, and close more new patients so you can grow the way that you want. But the biggest problem that's preventing people from growing is they don't have the people to grow. They don't have the team members. And today I have Debbie, who's the CEO uh, at H to be consultant and she's going to break down for you when it's appropriate to hire and when it's not appropriate to hire, when you can outsource or even hire a consultant to come in and help teach your team the right skills. And she breaks down the hygiene problem that we have from a point of view that I have not heard before. And I promise you, if you listen to this, this will give you a competitive advantage. You're going to want to stay tuned for this one. Why don't you share with the audience how you got into the dental industry? I think I got in the dental industry how everyone else did, right? It just fell right into it. <laughs> Total accident. Oh, yeah, I just, you know what? I had been working um, really with the focus primarily on building um uh, project management, program management, and IT teams uh, for my clients for, gosh, probably about 20 years. And so IT was definitely, that was my niche. Um, and I love it, still do. Uh, one of my, one of the folks that I was working with um, to provide workforce analytics, uh, really great company just to provide another service to some of my SMB clients, you know, if they wanted to do predictive uh, analytics or some sort of personality testing, I would engage this partner. Well, one of their clients was having one heck of a time finding a DOO. I mean, it'd been open for months, months yeah. and months. And they said, hey, you're great at talent. Can we make this introduction? Do you, can you do dental positions? <laughs> and I was feeling particularly confident that day, Gary. So I said, oh, of course I can. Yeah, why not? Exactly. I mean, all I need is conversation with a hiring managers, great job description and some time to research. And that's really how every IT position is recruited for anyway. So, um, Hey, got an important announcement for you. We are hosting the second annual full arch advantage event where you learn to create, convert and close more full arches. So your office can grow the way that you want. This is going to be in partnership with bio horizons. And this is our second year, but the important part is it's going to be virtual. So you don't have to fly out buy hotels, travel with your team. You can just register and block off the days and watch virtually. And right now we have early bird pricing. It's never going to be cheaper than right now. I don't even have a discount code because it's so cheap. It's only $199 right now to register. And it's for your team. It's for your dentists. It's for your treatment coordinators, your dental assistants, and your marketing managers. And you're going to learn a ton of stuff to grow. Last year's event had a 74 MPS score, which is amazing. And the feedback was really, really good. So if you're looking at leveling up, we have a ton of new content, a ton of new automations and things that you can add to your practice to really grow. And we're going to be going over a lot around sales and executing on the phones to make sure that you can grow the way that you want. So don't miss this. Go to Full Arch Advantage right now and sign up. This price will not be around for long. So I said, yeah, let me add it. In working that position, I met some of the best people on earth, right? So I was like, I'm actually building this wonderful organic network of professionals in dental trying to fill this one position. So should I leave after I fill this position or maybe stick around a little while? And then I started really just establishing meaningful personal relationships born of uh, business relationships developed in dental. So I'm here to stay, you know, this is, this is where I want to stay. And so right now what I'm working on is just working with folks uh, in dental at varying levels, right? Corporate enterprise level up to startup. We don't really know what we're doing. We've got a good idea level. They all have 
talent deficits. Mm. And so really that's where I'm stepping in and saying, um, how can we provide service? Is it in the form of uh, doing executive recruiting and direct placement and bringing your team to you? Or is it filling a, a intermediary talent gap mm. where we really just need a single job done and nobody here knows how to do it? Mm. Okay, well, you don't need to hire a person for that. You need to hire a contractor for a month or two, get the job done, check the box and move on with it. You know, so I'm really kind of looking at uh, especially with SMBs, you know, what's your talent strategy? What's the actual need? Because sometimes you don't need to hire a, an employee. You need to hire a contractor for a couple of months, help upskill some of your better performers, and then out they go and you've got somebody who has now got a cool new uh, skill set, you know? So it's it's really about just helping people fill their talent or, or solve their talent problems. So, okay, that's great. So that's, and this yeah. is the biggest struggle in the dental industry right now. I would say that- Not every, just dental. Yeah, everywhere, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. every everybody I talk to is like, well, uh, we, we didn't grow the way that we wanted. Okay, well, why? Well, <laughs> we didn't see enough new patients. Okay, why? Why didn't you? Because yeah. we didn't have enough people, right? Or, hey, we our cancellation's too high. Why? Because we're scheduling people too far out. Why? because we don't have enough people, right? Like all, every, all roads right. lead back to staffing right now. So I love your idea, or I love your thoughts because dental doesn't typically think this way on, you don't <laughs> always have to hire somebody, right? Like there's <laughs> there's other options besides hiring a full-time person at you know That's 50 right. to $100,000 a, a year. So walk me through that. How do I know if I'm a dentist, how do I know when it's appropriate to hire versus outsource versus maybe just teach my team a new skill? Sure. Uh, you first start, or start with what's your problem? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Well, we've got all these HR documents and we don't have an HR manager, so we don't know how to do all of these HR documents. OK, well, so let me hire an HR consultant. OK, they can get you over the hump. They'll get all of the documents in place. They'll walk you through the process. Are so you familiar with it? We'll check the box. They'll get you compliant. And then we'll see what other services you need at that HR level, because you may not have enough work for 40 hours to support the ask that a really great HR manager is going to want to come and join your team yeah. because a really great HR manager is already working right now. So to bring them out of that job, how are you going to bring them over? And yeah. then once they're there, if they're not feeling like they're providing some value, they're going to leave you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't, yeah. with that position, you can't just go hire somebody who doesn't have the skill set because then who's going to train them? That's right. Right. So, well, and look at HR management that is risk management, compliance. You don't want a rookie handling those boxes. You know, yeah. you want somebody. And that's why everybody's intimidated by yeah, of that the legal side of it, yeah. oversight. They understand the implications of, of not knowing what you're doing and, so, and the issues that could create. So if I was going to create a framework around this for like our audience, it's like, okay, how do you know when to hire a consultant to help you? Well, uh, is the person that you need to hire too expensive for you right now? That's one box, right? So that's it's one like, box, right? So that's one box. And then and then on the opposite end of that spectrum, if you hired somebody at minimum wage or a very low salary, would they know how to do the job intuitively? No. And you don't have anybody to train them? No. <laughs> no one okay. can train them. Right? Yeah. So, so now it's like, okay, we checked three boxes. It's like you can't, yeah. can't afford the people who are qualified and you also can't level down and then train them up on YouTube or whatever, right? Because there are certain jobs, right? Like you could go learn how to clean the office. Right. And, and from YouTube and do that properly. And there's videos on that. And you could actually go learn how to do that without without having to hire a professional. So so you can't just go just working through the framework. It's like can't afford the top talent. Also can't uh, bring in new talent and that that needs to learn the job. So if you if you if you check all those boxes, that's how, you know, you need to bring in an expert. How do you did I get that right? First of all, did I? I mean, okay. that's exactly it. Okay. And and do I have enough work for this for this one person to sit in chair for 40 hours every week? Approximately 50 
weeks a year, you know, you're not working yeah. every week, but look at, so if even you if you could afford, so then it's like part of that equation, even if you could afford that, uh, top talent, do you have enough to keep them busy? Uh, That's right. and you got to really look at that honestly, because the top talent won't stay with you if they're not staying busy, they want to feel appreciative and they want to have an impact. Okay, so yes. that's how, when impact bring it- is exactly it. Most people right now, millennials, Gen Z, they don't want to come to work just to sit in a chair and get paid. You know, decades ago, you could say, well, at least I'm getting paid for it. And everyone would chuckle and agree with you. And now they're like, well, I'm not doing anything. I'm bored. Yeah, I'm bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could be playing on my yeah. phone. Uh, and then they and then they detach themselves from yeah. the job because yeah. they don't feel like it's creating value and, and it's not checking their box of feeling I'm personally fulfilled because I know that I'm I'm important at work. Got it. Okay. So you so you broke down the framework of how to know when to bring in an expert versus hire yes. somebody. How how about do you have any thoughts or opinions on bringing in an expert versus bringing in a vendor to do the job? Like outsourcing? I think either can check the box. Okay. Either can check the box. So, so just and explore both depend. options. Explore both options, but don't convince yourself that you need to commit to hiring a new employee every time mm-hmm. you've got a need. Yeah. Um, many of my clients, I, I have consultants out in the field right now that are working, that are solving problems for my clients. And sometimes they are literally sitting in a chair, upskilling somebody at the client site because we need somebody who knows DevOps, yeah. but we can't afford to attract a really great DevOps person. Hmm. So I, I, I've got consultants that go out and provide upskilling, you know, for some of these niche areas where the hiring is a little bit more difficult. Okay. So, so let, going let in an and ex- taking... Oh, Let me give ahead, you an example. Let me give you a real life yeah. example. Okay. I see this all the time. So yes. people will work with us. They, we provide marketing services to them, right? We're driving new patients and they're like, okay, great. But I want to build some infrastructure for like internal marketing. And I want to build, yeah. you know, they want to do all this stuff, right? Cool stuff. So, you know, they'll have two practices, three practices, four practices, whatever. And they're like, I'm going to hire a fractional CMO. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I don't, that's, I don't think you're ready for that. Because right. you don't have somebody to do the work yet. So a CMO doesn't do the work. They give you strategy That's to right. help your team execute on the work. And so I see these people who will bring these CMOs in. And a lot of times they're outside of dental. So now the person has to learn dental plus execute, plus help you execute, plus be the strategy. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to pay them like $3,000 a month or 5000 whatever. And it's just like, it doesn't make... I'm just like, it always fails. Like every single right. time it always fails, it falls apart because they don't have the infrastructure for that person to actually put uh, put the strategy into, right? Like everybody's yeah. busy doing dentistry. What are your thoughts on like that? Is that, I've seen that in marketing. Do you see that in other fields as well around like fractional stuff? I, and I think that uh, the concern is always that they're not going to focus exclusively on us. And they're not going to be totally focused on us if they're fractional. If they're part-time, they've got multiple clients, um, you know, we're going to have a kind of a diluted concentration on our strategy and vision. And they want someone that's physically there that they can see, that they feel like, oh, yeah, they get us. Well, the problem is just having somebody physically in chair doesn't mean you're going to get the results. There are people who have in-house marketing teams that aren't producing any sort of true results. So um, I would say, you know what, I would always explore, especially with marketing first. I mean, it is, there are wonderful marketing agencies who really can take your strategy end to end. And it's a matter of you kind of providing content your team so that they can be interviewed, things like that. That's yeah. that's one of those areas where I think that there's tremendous potential value. But I think that the tendency is people want folks in the house. They just feel like for some reason there's this mentality that if they're ours, they're going to do a better job. But I can tell you there are marketing folks that are struggling to produce results in offices all over this country yeah. where – if that office had really invested 
an equal amount or less in an agency that could provide value and that the expectation is you will provide value because if you don't, you don't get your contract renewed. Yeah. Okay. What, You're incented. Okay, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're incentives, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what are, I'm going to change gears on you a little bit. What is the hardest position right now in dental to fill for people? Hygienist, hygienists, I think. Okay, what would be second? All right, second after hygienists. Um, yeah, I think that regionals. So break that down. What does that mean? I think that uh, when you're looking at regional operations managers, the folks who are going to be out in the field, um, people don't want to be traveling the way that these folks are expected to hmm. travel anymore. Um, and they're getting burned out. And a lot of the folks that I'm working with who are passively looking, who are miserable at work, many of them are burned out regional operations managers who are either repeatedly uh, overlooked for promotion. They're not seeing that there's an end in sight. They're talking to me about, do you think I have a chance of moving into a different industry? Oh. So um, there's a lot of burnout. And I'll tell you, my big concern for my dental clients is that I am hearing from so many burnout people at the operations management level and at the dental hygiene, uh, dental hygienist level. If, if you don't have folks who are running production, then yeah, how so much profitability are you leaving on the table? Yeah, we've 30, talked. 30, yeah, 30, 33%? I think yeah. everybody kind of is aware of the hygiene problem and there's actually yeah. no easy fix besides hire a bunch of part-time hygienists and retain your team. You know what I mean? There's not, there's not like, there's not going to be more, um, well, maybe let's talk about that then. Cause yeah, maybe yeah. I would love it if you, if you look at it differently. So what I have seen is that when Dennis put up no matter, pretty much no matter what amount of money they put up there, if they put up a full-time position, they get almost no hits for the position just because mm -hmm. hygienists aren't interested in that right now. They want flexibility. They want to be able to pick their hours. And so basically yeah. for the people who I've seen who've been able to fill their hygiene stable with hygienists, it's been because they create flexible schedules, pick your schedule, and they hire way more hygienists. So before they might've only needed five, now they need to hire 12. And that means somebody has to manage it. But now they have a full hygiene roster and they're constantly keeping it full. And then they use temp agencies to, as recruiting arms, basically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, is there any other way to solve that from your point of view? Well, I think one of the biggest problems is retention. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, people are like, wow, we keep on losing them left and right. You know, these with these hygienists, we can't keep them. We can't keep them. Have you asked why? Have you asked why they're leaving? Mm. Because they're not always being lured away by more money. Yeah. In many cases, they're being lured away because they'd like to not be sexually harassed at work. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's a very, I mean, okay. that's a so that is a go. very real. That's a very well, real being, complaint. That's like that's, oh, I am that's, not being facetious. Wow. So that's like so that's right now. You're talking to people and they're like, "Hey, I'm looking for a job, and if I could just not be sexually harassed, that would be great." I'd like to be respected at work and not just you know treated like a piece of meat. Why do you or, think? Why do you think that's such a um, a prevalent thing uh we hire beautiful people in dental don't we there are a lot of really beautiful people in dental it's very easy to sell beauty when you're beautiful right so the so because... hygienists so hygienists are typically female right and they're mm -hmm. typically yeah. a little bit young, Many. They're still young. yeah yeah, they're most of yeah. them. Like I would say, yeah. I don't know the number on it, but it has to be huge. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a rare thing when you meet a male hygienist, right? Like it, it doesn't, is. it doesn't yeah. happen every day, yeah. right? So, and they're usually a little bit younger, younger families. Like that's this, they're, you know, that's usually the, the demographic. And then mm -hmm. who's, is it typically the dentist, uh, the owner that's having that problem, or is it the other teams? Like what? Yes, yes. <laughs> and I think many of them aren't, um, maybe aware enough that they can say stop it um to actually say stop it and so maybe they giggle and feel uncomfortable and don't say anything and then quit yeah they quit so okay and so, then they quit so, and they don't tell you on the way out i'm quitting because yeah, of course dr not. so and so is always yeah. making really inappropriate comments to me it makes me feel extremely uncomfortable i can't say anything in front of the patients um 
they don't say anything. They just quit. So if you want to grow your your dental practice, don't be a creep. I would put that as well. A, that, a I mean, top. yeah, that's a yeah. yeah. Really, if you want to succeed in any way, that should yeah. be a golden rule. But yeah. um, yeah, it's it's sexual harassment. It's I'm being placed in a moral dilemma. Like I like how right? so? So break that uh, down. Many of them just don't feel comfortable selling services because they have to, especially when they are getting to know these patients. And these are people who are telling them that my husband hasn't been working for six months and my, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling and I finally just got a job. And now Dr. So-and-so would like you to tell this person they need five crowns and so is it so is it a dilemma of like okay we're dealing with people that just can't afford the treatment and i don't want to talk about it or is it more the doctors just being really aggressive with the treatment i think that it is uh having certain expectations around sales that you will be selling in the chair um and nobody i don't think that people necessarily explain to hygienists really when they're learning their craft that this is really a sales job in large part, this is a sales job. And had they known that many, many of them wouldn't have taken it. Gary, mm -hmm. if they wanted a sales job, they'd have likely gone after a sales job, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they didn't. And so maybe they're not wired for sales for many of them. It takes them outside of their comfort zone. They like to go in and work on the patients and get to know them and chat with them. And it makes them feel uncomfortable to be placed in positions when they have to sell to someone who they know potentially can't serve it or, or afford it. Um, I think that is part of it. I also think that it is, um, you know, just quite frankly, outside of the comfort zone. You know, yeah. it's just outside of their comfort zone. And I think that if they were allowed to create meaningful, long lasting relationships with patients who later learn to trust them and then oh, love them so much that they tell all their families and friends yeah. about them, that is a better revenue generation strategy than for selling services to your patients and chair. Yeah. So do you think this is the norm that yes. hygienists that are going through this? So like the sexual harassment or just like the not treating them well, let's just say, and the not, um, and then the over treating or having, putting your hygienist in a position where they're not comfortable, you would say that's the norm. And that's probably why a lot of hygienists are jumping around. It's just common complaints. I mean, when I'm talking to people every day, I'm asking, why are you leaving? Why are you yeah. leaving your current role? You know? Well, and well, what how many, so I'm trying to figure out like, okay, for our audience, like how can we mm -hmm. flip this into a competitive advantage, right? Like you clearly can't put it on the top of your job post, like, and we don't sexually harass you or tell you to sell things, right? Like, so no, no, how do we here's the thing. You won't need to, you won't need to tell anybody because your dental hygienists who are being treated respectfully are going to be doing that for you. So they're going to be and doing that's the going to carry a lot more weight okay, than so some clever marketing campaign that says we retreat our people with respect. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. everyone else says the same thing. Of course. Yeah, that doesn't work. Right. So then so yeah. here's what I'm trying to get to is like how many offices actually operate at the level that we want them to. Right. So this ideal like, is it 10%, you would say 20% just in your experience, because the smaller the number, I would the... say this, um, I would say 10% are getting it right. Got it. So then I think 10% of the companies out there, I can't touch your people. They're ah, happy. That's how you look at it. So you you're measuring it as, man, I need to go find somebody for these people, a good person. <laughs> And 10% of the offices out there, they won't come with me no matter what I offer them because, because they're, they're so happy. happy. Yeah. They're and the reason happy. they're happy is because they're not doing the things we just talked about. And they, they will tell you, uh, when, I, when I can't touch people, that's when I ask more questions. Why not? Yeah. What's the yeah, good yeah. about this place? You know, yeah. and they're like, I mean, look at, they have, you know, provided me with educational opportunities. I've been promoted. I'm being paid well. I'm being respected at work. We do a lot of really cool uh, team building things. They feel like a 
I hate to use the F word, a family. You know, these are my friends outside of work that I'm kicking it with. And it's because the culture that's been created there is one where there is zero tolerance for anything other than respectability amongst everyone else that's part of this team. And those are the companies that I'm like, I want to recruit for that company, you know, because I, I know I can do that with a yeah, with these. Right? And, and I've actually I've actually since I started probably um, since I started my own business, I've probably fired more clients than I have kept because um, them, yeah. I I I've got to feel good about the company and the position that I would be recruiting, be recruiting someone into. That's so awesome. Um, so this has been really, really good. This is uh, the thing I love about this is that this isn't a KPI that you can look at necessarily. This is a <laughs> culture, um, a culture approach. And when you do it correctly, it puts you at such a competitive advantage that no one mm -hmm. else can really touch you. So that's, that's amazing. And the question for you, last question for you, Debbie, if someone has a question or wants to learn more about what you guys are doing, where, how do they get in touch with you? Oh, uh, LinkedIn. I'm almost always on there. So, uh, and I invite anyone, just send me an invitation to connect. Let me know that you heard about me on Gary Bird Show and I am thrilled to connect. Um, we clearly have some things in common if that's how you heard about me. And uh, look at a lot of my business is built on karma. So I am open to having conversations always. A lot of times people will call me up and they'll say, hey, we're thinking about hiring this person. I'm like, yeah, you don't need to hire a person. Go get on this platform and, uh, you know, go get a bamboo HR. You don't need an HR manager. Go pay the, uh, go pay bamboo HR, go pay Rippling, go pay for one of these platforms that's embedded HR compliance. It's onboarding. It's everything you need. They're going to give you the paperwork, everything you need in terms of uh, state withholding setup. Go pay that modest licensure instead of hiring an HR manager until you have a team with so many HR related needs that you know now we need someone who can concentrate on our policies, procedures, onboarding, hiring. You know, we need a hiring strategy. We need a retention strategy. That's when you hire. Got it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Debbie. This is really good. I learned something new today and thanks I love, I love when, uh, when, when uh, things click like this. this is really good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your time, Gary. Take care. Bye-bye.